Hi, I'm Laura Gagel. I'm an editor at Live Science, and today we are joined by Andrea Jones, a science communicator at NASA. Andrea, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're also excited for the lunar eclipse that's coming up. I was wondering if you could tell us what normally happens every month with the full moon and why is this full moon a lunar eclipse? Sure, so every month we have a full moon when the sun, the earth, and the moon line up, but the moon is a little bit higher or a little bit lower than the earth's shadow. And so the full moon uh, that's facing us can be lit up by the sun and we see this beautiful full moon. This month, it will be a little bit different because the moon will be as close as it can get to the earth in its orbit. So it will be the biggest and brightest full moon of the year. Um, and that's really exciting. And this full moon will be also very exciting because it happens to be a lunar eclipse. So instead of going above or below the earth's shadow, the moon will actually pass directly into earth's shadow, which will turn it a brilliant coppery red color. Oh, let's talk more about that. So why does it turn this reddish color? Yeah, so the moon turns red during a lunar eclipse for kind of a cool reason. So when the moon passes into Earth's shadow, the Earth blocks most of the sun's light, but a little bit gets through in the atmosphere um, heading towards the moon. And so that's a whole lot of Earth's atmosphere, um, just like it has to go through at sunrise or sunset. And so if you were standing on the moon during a lunar eclipse and you looked back at the Earth, you would see a ring of red light all of the sunrises and sunsets on Earth happening at that moment are projecting red light onto the moon, which is what we see during a lunar eclipse. Wow, that sounds beautiful. Um, I, know, I know there's been a few volcanic eruptions lately. Is that going to influence the color at all? So yeah, the dustier the atmosphere is, um, the better the color will be. And so yes, we do have actually slightly different colors uh, depending on where the moon falls in the Earth's shadow and also depending on what's going on in the atmosphere. All right. So where in the world is the best place to be to see the eclipse? Viewers out west are really going to have the best view. In fact, if you get on a boat or head to Hawaii, middle of the Pacific Ocean is a really terrific place to be viewing this eclipse. But I would love to go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wouldn't we all? That would be wonderful. Um, so everyone who is able to see the moon with clear skies will be able to see the super moon. Um, but out west is where the real show will begin. Um, so around 5 uh, 45 a.m. Eastern time. So um, around 2 45 a.m. Pacific is when the partial eclipse will begin. Um, for viewers on the east coast, the moon will largely set before we have the whole eclipse. Um, but out west, if you're able to watch from out there, at 4.15 a.m. we'll have the total eclipse starting and that will last for about 15 minutes. I see. Um, you've mentioned the word supermoon a few times. Can you tell us what that means? So supermoon is kind of an informal term for that biggest, brightest full moon of the year. So the Earth's orbit, or sorry, the moon's orbit around the Earth is a little bit elongated. It's not a perfect circle. So sometimes the moon is closer to the Earth and sometimes it's farther from the Earth. And a supermoon is when the moon is closest to the Earth and it's a full moon, which makes it appear a little bigger and a little brighter than our average full moon. Okay, so this moon is the closest full moon of the year, but will the average Joe be able to discern that? <laughs> well, if you're a really avid uh, moon watcher, you may be able to tell, but the, the super moon will be about 14% bigger and 30% brighter than a full moon that occurs when the moon is farthest from the Earth, which is a little bit uh, hard for most observers to be able to tell. <laughs> but if you can, that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll take a brighter moon any day. That sounds great. <laughs> Great time for nighttime hikes. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, do you have any tips for sky gazers who want to catch the eclipse? And I know it's way early in the morning, so they might have to forgo some shut eye. Yeah, so for viewers on the East Coast, uh, the, the partial eclipse starts around 5.45 a.m. Eastern. So set your alarm early and get some coffee and head out. Um, and you can certainly see a, a really neat view that we don't get very often. And then if you'd like to keep watching, um, if you're out west, you can keep watching throughout the eclipse. But if you're not able to see if the moon sets before it hits total eclipse where you are, you can keep watching on moon.nasa.gov and see the whole thing. Nice. 
Can you walk us through the different stages of the eclipse? I know there's like the penumbral and then the partial. How does that work? Yeah, so the penumbra is the part of Earth's shadow where the sun is only partially blocked. The sunlight's only partially blocked. So we have sort of a, a shadow behind the Earth and the cone in the center, the umbra, that's where the, the uh, sun's light is blocked the most. So when the moon travels into the penumbra, it will seem only a little bit dimmer. To most viewers, you won't tell a really noticeable difference, but the real action begins when the moon enters into that umbra. And that's the part where you're going to start seeing the bright moon um, have like a little a little bite taken out of it almost. It's like a cookie being eaten up uh, by the earth's shadow. And then once it's in the middle of that, you'll see the bright, brilliant reddish color from all those sunrises and sunsets with the sun's light being uh, scattered by the Earth's atmosphere. And then it will start emerging again. So the whole process will go in reverse and you'll start to see the moon emerge and there's going to be a bright spot and then it'll keep lightening. And then in the penumbra, you won't notice a big difference, but once it fully emerges, it will again be that really big, bright, bright moon um, of the super moon this year. That's awesome. So can NASA scientists learn anything from this eclipse? Will they be using it to do any kind of experiments? Actually, very exciting for this particular eclipse is that we are going to be studying it uh, with a mission that I work with, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so most of the time, uh, recently especially, we have been turning our, our scientific instruments off our mission has been at the moon for almost 12 years, and so we're trying to be really conservative with battery power, but we have done some analysis and we know that we can safely leave our diviner instrument on. So this is a thermal radiometer. It's going to be checking out the temperature of the moon's surface. So normally the moon cools pretty slowly throughout the lunar night, uh, but during a lunar eclipse, when the earth is blocking the sun's light, it cools much more rapidly. And so we can find out what the near surface uh, thermal environment is, what's happening at the upper few centimeters of the moon's surface uh, during a lunar eclipse, which is pretty exciting. And we're gonna compare that to some observations we're gonna make from earth of the whole moon throughout the lunar eclipse. So it should be a pretty exciting science story tonight. Wow, I never thought about the moon's surface changing temperature because of the light falling on it. That's fascinating. Absolutely. Just like going on the beach or hiking on rocks, um, the sand cools at a, or the, the fine particles like sand or like dust, like regolith, um, cool differently than our bedrock does. And so by finding out how the temperature of the moon uh, changes throughout the lunar day and throughout a lunar eclipse, we can find out more of what it's made of. Wow. Very cool. Well, I hope you have a happy eclipse watching, watching session <laughs> coming up. I know I'm looking forward to it. Andrea Jones, thank you so much for joining us at Live Science today. Thank you so much for having me.